Bem-vindos ao Observatório da Imprensa. Quero compartilhar com vocês uma experiência extraordinária. Encontrei o humanismo em estado puro. Entrevistei, durante 50 minutos, o sociólogo e pensador polonês Zygmunt Bauman, quase 90 anos, conhecidíssimo no Brasil, é, que não é apenas um homem cultíssimo, uma verdadeira enciclopédia, ele é muito mais, mas muito mais do que isso. Ele é uma alma intensa, onde todas essa, essas informações são processadas humanamente. Eu tenho certeza que vocês vão ter a mesma sensação que eu tive. Sigmund Bauman nasceu na Polônia em 1925. Aos 89 anos, é um dos intelectuais mais respeitados da atualidade. Na juventude, serviu no exército da União Soviética e chegou a lutar na Segunda Guerra Mundial. Depois do fim do conflito, se formou em Sociologia e deu aula na Universidade de Varsóvia. Perseguido por ser judeu, perdeu o emprego de professor e suas obras foram proibidas na Polônia. Eu acho que esse é, uma, é um traço importante na, na história pessoal dele, não só na história pessoal dele, como na história da sua esposa, de Janina. Janina, não é? Ambos foram marcados pela, pelo antissemitismo e pela perseguição aos judeus. No caso da esposa dele, a perseguição nazista, e no caso dele, a perseguição pelo regime stalinista. É? Balma permanece na Polônia depois da Segunda Guerra Mundial, portanto, no regime é, socialista, soviético, que toma conta da Polônia, e a, a, que foi um regime que não... Embora não tivesse o antissemitismo como uma ideologia de Estado, tal como o nazismo teve, era um regime no qual práticas antissemitas e valores antissemitas é, é, tiveram presente. Eles tiveram, os judeus da Polônia, diante de si, indiferença beirando hostilidade por parte dos compatriotas poloneses e hostilidade indo até o assassinato por parte dos invasores alemães. Então, ficou muito difícil essa situação. Acho admirável, é, principalmente, os depoimentos dele é, com relação ao Holocausto. Ele foi judeu. Eu acho válidos, eu acho uma voz como a dele, que é prestigiada internacionalmente, continuar falando é, dos judeus, da perseguição. Da, é, portanto, eu, eu tenho muita admiração pela cabeça dele. Bauman se mudou para a Inglaterra, onde vive até hoje e trabalha como professor da Universidade de Leeds. Ele acredita que a sociologia é uma ciência que pode ajudar a desfazer impasses que atormentam a sociedade há séculos. Bauman é um pensador muito singular. Ele pertence a uma geração de intelectuais que pensa questões da sociedade com uma formação filosófica muito forte. Ele é um tipo de intelectual é, em extinção. Quer dizer, não se fazem mais Baumans a partir de um certo momento. Então ele não é simplesmente um sociólogo, né? Quer dizer, alguém que se observa de, de uma perspectiva disciplinar os problemas sociais. Ele tem uma formação mais generalista, quer dizer, ele vem da filosofia, ele tem profundas informações históricas. Ele é, portanto, um exemplo dos intelectuais humanísticos né? que ainda existiram durante o século XX. A teoria desenvolvida por Bauman é aclamada pelos intelectuais e já rendeu os prêmios a Malfi pelo livro Modernidade e Holocausto e Adorno pelo conjunto da obra. Bauman já publicou 35 livros no Brasil. Entre os trabalhos mais conhecidos está o Amor Líquido, onde ele analisa as relações nos tempos modernos. Para o pensador, elas se tornaram mais flexíveis e geram níveis de insegurança maiores. Segundo Bauman, as pessoas não sabem mais como manter laços de longo prazo e muitas vezes se relacionam apenas no mundo virtual, o que acaba aumentando a solidão. Bauman define este comportamento como a modernidade líquida, onde nada é feito para durar. Os relacionamentos escorrem por entre os dedos como água. Bauman faz uma descrição do mundo atual baseada na ideia do, de líquido, de liquefazer, de que tudo que é sólido se desmancha, de que nada persiste e, sobretudo, o laço social está cada vez mais tênue. Ele dá como grande exemplo disso o que acontece nas redes, uma disponibilidade 
sem precedentes na história de opções amorosas, de consumo, profissionais, de viagem, que faz que nós estejamos o tempo todo seduzidos, mas, que não, mas sem dar densidade, sem dar continuidade, sem dar compromisso, sem construir vínculos. Essa crítica que ele faz, ela aparece na metáfora da liquidez, quer dizer, a ideia de que o mundo está se liquefazendo, que as interações são interações que perderam, a, digamos assim, a sua estrutura, a sua organicidade, abrindo espaço para o mundo muito mais aleatório, no qual o sentido, o sentido parece desaparecer ou se multiplicar infinitamente. Então, ele é observador disso, né? de como é que a modernidade deu passagem a formas sociais dissipadas, enquanto que as crenças que a gente tinha até um século atrás, é de que as sociedades civilizadas ou modernas eram sociedades integradas. A gente nota que, efetivamente, está muito fácil você desfazer uma relação. Também é fácil começar certas relações, mas desfazê-las é muito fácil. O descarte, antigamente, tinha rituais. Por exemplo, você se casava, casamento era indissolúvel, uh, desfazer um casamento indissolúvel era muito complicado. Às vezes, isso significava você sair da lei, inclusive. Hoje foi ficando cada vez mais fácil, hoje você desfaz um casamento num cartório, você não precisa nem, nem ir à justiça, quer dizer, nós desritualizamos a separação. E isso talvez seja uma coisa complicada, porque isso quer dizer que banalizamos a, a dissolução do laço. Você cria um laço, você fortalece o laço e de um momento para o outro você acaba com ele. Essa é uma experiência muito dura. Zygmunt Bauman também é um crítico dos meios de comunicação, que, segundo ele, ajudam a espalhar e a banalizar o medo. É uma crítica que chama atenção para a necessidade de mais lentidão, né? de mais reflexão, de mais hesitação reflexiva. Né? E recusar criticamente a hipervelocidade, tá certo? A hipervelocidade que acaba, que acaba contaminando e que é a característica central desse processo incontável de dispersão de imagens e de, 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 de informação. Quer dizer, informação sem reflexão. Eu acho que esse é o, é o, é o, é o dilema, a tensão, para a qual ele está ele, ele atento e ele chama atenção. Olha, o medo é um, é um recurso de administração do social. Ah, o Estado, é, no, ao, quando administra o risco, então, o, e com suas, o Estado e seus braços, o seguro... É, que nos empurram, que nos vende. Sim, nós temos que fazer seguro, porque senão roubam um o carro. Mas eu tenho medo de que roube meu carro. Ao mesmo tempo, o medo de adoecer e não ter médico. É esse medo que me faz ter um plano de saúde. É o medo de andar na rua sem ter segurança. Aí se multiplica o aparelho policial. O medo de que invadam as fronteiras nacionais ou outro país. E aí... Nós pagamos imposto para que o Exército supostamente defenda as fronteiras. Então, o medo é um recurso hoje do Estado. Professor Bauman, during the last 27 years, uh, Zahar, the publishing house, published at least 35 titles by, by you, with youth uh, books, with a total of almost 600,000 copies. This is a this is a literary phenomena because you your books are not concerned with niceties nor mundane matters. It's it's uh, substance. Yeah. How do you explain this this uh, this record? Well, uh, I, I I learned it from you about the thousands of copies I had not Publishers never told me, so I don't know. <laughs> but, we have uh, to go now to the... <laughs> right. But, uh, you see, uh, I, I consider my uh, vocation, so to speak, uh, the nature of uh, the work I am doing, it's called sociology. Uh, sociology was uh, a relatively new phenomenon in universities, uh, 150 years old, at maximum 200 years, no more. And it entered uh, the modern era where it was born under the slogan of helping managers to manage people. Uh, to how to, you know, to prevent workers from going on strike, to prevent uh, soldiers from deserting the army, to prevent 
uh, prevent uh, children from uh, missing school, um, how to fight things like juvenile delinquency, alcoholism, and so on. In other words, how to achieve positive effect in managing other people. How to force or persuade or tempt other people to follow your own idea of order. And that was managerial philosophy of the time. Um, well, you are almost my age, not far, still far from it, but almost. And uh, you remember Frederick Taylor, you remember Henry Ford Sr. They are the symbols of the tendency. Um, Frederick Taylor, in his um, measurement of time and move, move, movement, uh, uh, assumed that the purpose of good management is to create a setting for the employee action that deprives the employee of options, of alternatives. He has to do what the setting dictates. And, uh, and uh, Henry Ford Sr. put it in practice. If you remember Charlie yes, Chaplin, of course. Of modern <laughs> times, well, uh, he actually replaced the subjectivity of the worker with the uh, speed of conveyor belt, of the assembly line. Assembly line brings a detail, you have to manipulate, you don't have any other uh, movement conceivable. Managers took upon themselves by cleverly uh, designing the surrounding of the employee, took upon themselves responsibility for the results. They swore that if you only listen to me, if you design the setting of the work, the workbench like that, the results will be positive. And uh, sociology tries to meet the demand, you know, to show what needs to be taken into account to achieve and this to effect. to change also. Right. Uh, mind you, it is not me who changed. It is the managerial philosophy who changed. Managerial philosophy today is very different. Managers don't, no longer want to manage, don't, no longer want to take responsibility for the effects of other people working. No, they move the, uh, the responsibility on the shoulders of their subordinates. Subordinate must prove to the manager that he is worthy of keeping in work, uh, that the, bring the results, bring the results. The meeting between the manager and the worker starts after results have been already brought in, and not before. Uh, which means that on you, on me, on every other ordinary person who is in one or another form of employment, uh, it, the burden of making decisions with your own life, understanding how the world is going, is rotating, uh, what is the mechanism uh, between uh, thinking and motives and results? Now, all of that you have to acquire as your own skill. As the great uh, German sociologist Ulrich Beck uh, put it very concisely and very uh, correctly, uh, it is in our times the individual is obliged, expected and obliged, to find individual solutions to Person. socially Person. created problems. If that is the case, for me, for some sociologists, it was a tragedy. Uh, there was, in 1990s, there was a panic among sociologists. We are losing touch with the public arena. What they really meant is that the old recipients of their services are no longer interested in, the, in, in this kind of services. For me, on the contrary, it was finally liberation of sociology from this slavery, you know, to, to, do, do to you manage the reason, yeah. To serve directly people on whom the burden of making things, making choices, making good life falls. So, do you think this is the secret of your best-selling? I don't know. I, what I know is 25 years or 34 years, I stopped writing for other sociologists. I, I, was, I just cut the middleman. 
So uh, I address directly problems with which non-sociologists, ordinary people, this is the main are problem. confronted. And I think that I've, I am very pleased that they uh, agree with me, that that's are really their problems. And it, you are right. There's no, no better reward for, for a thinker as uh, people finding these thoughts useful. Of course. Yeah. Let me ask you, the Chinese consider interesting times those with drastic changes, transformations, shocks, yeah. hard choices. Uh, do you think that we are living now interesting times? Yeah, well, uh, uh, this uh, particular uh, Chinese uh, uh, attitude is only half true. Uh, it, because uh, living in interesting times, in my view, is uh, a mixture of uh, curse and blessing. <laughs> uh, so it's not just curse, it is also a blessing. Blessing for thinking, caring people, because it brings brings to the uh, uh, attention, into vision, things which in normal, ordinary, quiet, uninteresting, repeatable, routine, boring times uh, are, uh, are invisible. You, are, you know, the, there is an expression, hiding in the light. There are so much in the light that you don't notice them any longer. Interesting times, mean trouble sometimes. Time, oh, yes. oh, yes. Something happens which was not expected, was not predicted, was not noticeable. Uh, Martin Heidegger, the great German philosopher, uh, would say that interesting times bring things from 200 to 400. 200 means given to hand, you know. You are, you are, they are so close that they are so predictable that you don't notice them any longer. The forehand then is something else. You distantiate, you, you take, to take your distance. Yes. There is an object, I don't know this object, I must learn something. I, make, I must make the unfamiliar familiar. familiar. So it is a benefit of interesting times. And uh, fortunately, uh, well, God gave us the chance of being creative and knowledgeable by putting us in uh, interesting times. And as far as the curse side of that is concerned, unfortunately, it's our task to resolve it. O observatório da imprensa faz um rápido intervalo na entrevista com o filósofo humanista Zygmunt Bauman. Voltamos daqui a instantes. Voltamos agora ao Observatório da Imprensa com a entrevista do pensador humanista Zygmunt Bauman, polonês, com quase 90 anos, que deu uma entrevista exclusiva para o Observatório da Imprensa. Na recente visita ao Brasil, o polonês Zygmunt Bauman participou de um seminário internacional sobre educação. Com quase 90 anos de idade, ele falou durante uma hora e demonstrou muita disposição na palestra que teve como tema os desafios líquidos modernos para a educação. Para Bauman, educar é como fazer um investimento para os próximos 100 anos. Hoje, de acordo com o filósofo, a educação reproduz privilégios em vez de aperfeiçoar a sociedade. O pensador disse ainda que a educação é vítima da modernidade líquida. Existe uma grave crise de atenção, na qual os jovens não conseguem se concentrar durante um longo tempo em uma mesma questão. Tudo é rápido e superficial. Na opinião de Bauman, a internet trouxe benefícios e um grande desafio. Como compreender todas as informações que conseguimos acessar de forma instantânea nos sites de pesquisa. Praticamente todas as invenções apenas satisfizeram um desejo humano que já pré-existia. Por exemplo, andar mais depressa, o carro, voar, o avião, uh, etc. As redes sociais 
e os desdobramentos mais recentes da internet mudam de figura isso, porque aí você passa a ter invenções que precedem o desejo delas. Não havia um desejo de algo que se chamaria Facebook. Esse algo que se chama Facebook surge e ele próprio vai modulando comportamentos humanos diferentes que a gente tenta depois entender quais são. Então, é uma novidade muito grande a rede social. E, então, nesse sentido, o meio, a rede social, modula não só a mensagem, como também as próprias relações das pessoas. Com o Facebook, tudo isso que o Bauman fala de fragilidade do lado social, vai às estrelas. Quer dizer, é muito mais fácil você estabelecer um contato e desfazê-lo. O compromisso ah, praticamente some. E há um traço no Facebook que é que não existe delay para você postar uma coisa. Você lê algo, você faz, uh, digita rapidamente e manda em tempo real uma reação de fígado, que às vezes é muito agressiva e que pode ter efeitos complicados. We feel those days because of Europe, because of everything, Brazil, that we are living in a state of war without without uh, fighting yeah. in general. So uh, what is happening with, with this kind of, of world that people are insecure, they, they, are, they, they live uh, with yeah. discomfort, uh, as uh, Freud detected uh, so many years ago. Yeah. People are not happy. Yeah. Well, uh Clausewitz uh, famously said that the war is politics by other means. I would say that uh, also the other way it is true. Politics is the war by other means. But uh, I, wouldn't go, I, I, I wouldn't go as far as so, be so extreme as to say that we are living in a state of war. I know uh, there are of... arguments to, to uh, support this view. But uh, I am concerned rather with the existential condition. That's what I am dealing with. The existential conditions of human beings as individuals, self-asserting, self-regulating, uh, well, self-controlling even in, in a sense. Uh, what, I, what you call the state of war, I would uh, call the state of permanent... Uh, Suspic mutual suspicion and competition. We are all potentially in competition with each other. Uh, once upon a time there were, for example, collective bargaining. The whole stuff of a factory or an office joined together, they were collective power, and they negotiate the conditions of their employment. That had been deregulated, it's no longer on. Uh, the companies uh, consider, and that is the part of the new philosophy of management, that uh, periodical redundancies, periodical economies, periodical restructuring, which in each such case some uh, people are made redundant, that they are necessary element of good management. Necessary element. Why? Because it puts all the uh, surviving members of the, of the staff, uh, uh, well, uh, looking suspiciously to the neighbors, not uniting their interests to resist the employers, but on the contrary, trying to prove to the employers that when it comes to the next round of redundancies, he should be fired. <laughs> the other. <laughs> right, quite. So we are forced in the situation requiring constant vigilance, mutual vigilance and competition. And that's what creates the atmosphere of war. Nothing is certain, nothing is secure. You have to look around, you know, and be careful. Um, friends may turn into enemies, you know, there's no point in developing loyalty to somebody till death do us part because, well, come different conditions, different circumstances, the whole the calculation of gains and losses may change, and so on, and so on. Professor, we, we now live better and more. We are supposed to, to know much more. We demand and sometimes we get more. 
but we are less repressed. Despite the fulfillments of so many dreams, uh, we are still unhappy. Uh, and who is, to, who is to blame, the economy or the other way? So what went wrong? Yeah. Well, I wonder whether we are more knowledgeable than Aristotle. No, uh, no, no. Uh, I am not, I am quite sure, but what about the others? Uh, it's not, not quite clear. Uh, e. O. Wilson, the great uh, yes. uh, biologist, uh, used to say that we are, uh, uh, we are inundated by information and starving for, knowledge, for wisdom. <laughs> starving for wisdom. And he's right. When I was a young person, I, uh, I believed together with my generation and partly your generation that what uh, prevents us from resolving all issues in the world is absence of the right knowledge. We need more research, more funds for research, more data, more, more information. Now I believe uh, that it is the other way around, that the main obstacle is uh, the excess of knowledge, excess of, of information. We are flooded with information. Every day, the new information produced is, according to some uh, statistics, thousands times bigger than the ability human, to, of human brain to assume. To use. So uh, whenever I put uh, to Google a question about uh, uh, information on something, whatever it is, uh, I get uh, several dozens of billions of answers. So uh, too much. it paralyzes me. I, 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 what I learn from Google is that I will never know what I know should. And that's not necessarily that I am more wise, wiser than I was. You know? I, of course, I have childishly easy access to information. I don't have to go to the library, look for hundreds of books in order to find one information I'm looking for. It is all at the distance of my fingers. I can do it without moving from my chair even. Does it mean that I'm wiser? I'm not sure. I am not sure. On the contrary, I'm humiliated rather. Humiliated as not, uh, not only not being wiser than I am, but uh, the very impossibility of acquire the wisdom which, allow, which uh, allows you, uh, allows you uh, to really authoritatively, responsible, responsibly answer to the question which is in front of you. Fortunately, we have Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook, you know, we have, <laughs> we have Google, we have other things which uh, supply us with uh, what I know, uh, uh, tranquilizers, tranquilizers for uh, uh, recognized ailments which we suffer, like loneliness, lack of knowledge, and so on. We can have a, some sort of a substitute. Um, the Google has the largest library in the world, but it's not a uh, library of books. It is a la library of snippets, of quotations, of bits and pieces, unconnected. Now, uh, we can get every bit and piece, whenever we like, very quickly. But whether that, that amounts to better knowledgeability, I don't know. My general answer to your question is that uh, I don't believe that uh, uh, we resolve issues completely, not only now, but also in previous epochs. Um, Gordon Allport once say that uh, uh, we never resolve issues, we only get bored of them, uh, abandon <laughs> them. That's one part of the aspect, but the other is that uh, all answers we are able to give are until further notice. They are bound to be left, uh, left behind by further development of knowledge, it's all temporary. The trouble that we can get get the complete knowledge of, of anything is uh, mitigated, mitigated by this service of tranquilizers. Because what we are offered is not the task 
of getting the vision of the totality, but the great amount of footnotes in what we are writing. If you have 200 footnotes, it is scholarly, <laughs> it's scientific. You know, and that saves you this big trouble. <laughs> but do you think that the, some, uh, what lacks, what humanity lacks, is the human bondage? For instance, we never met, but uh, we have something in common. Human bond bondage. Bondage, yes. yes. We, we never met, but uh, yeah. something we have in common Well, there are uh, points of correlation in our biographies, I think. We are, to start with, we are coming from the same uh, cultural heritage area, right? And uh, we're born into it, you know, some inherited it. On the other hand, uh, we live uh, through the same historical phases and experience them point blank, directly, not just reading books about them. <laughs> Uh, a young person asked uh, uh, whether um, uh, uh, Napoleon or Alexander the Great lived in the same uh, millennium. I find it difficult to answer. Mount <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mao Zedong. <laughs> yeah, you know, but that is the problem. That we have lived through the event. So uh, I think we are in common. I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't. Uh, Uh, ever suggest that individualization, which is really happening today in society, led to uh, diversification, atomization of society. No, society has its uh, uh, diasporas, so to speak, which are mixed together in one play space, but in fact spiritually mean uh, lived today separately. Mm -hmm. And what about our media, the media? Uh, the combination of entertainment with news g reporting, is, yeah. is, is it dangerous or is it good? How do you see the, the press, especially the press? Yeah. Well, Marshall McLuhan, you remember, yes. it's, well, yeah. it's forgotten, unduly forgotten, he was a wise man. Uh, he spoke about media is the message. Media is the message. Not only the information it delivers, but the very way in which it delivers this information is already a message. And the message, you are right, message of mass media is that um, news, in order to be worthy of your attention, need to be entertaining. Entertaining. And that's a very costly effect, very costly effect because Students more and more are expecting of their, from their teachers in universities entertaining products. And uh, they, uh, for example, the plague uh, of which uh, the university teacher complained quite widely is that students, not to mention book of the volume, of the size of the uh, war and peace, <laughs> but even one article, you know, one article which is pros prescribed to them to read, to, feed, to read it from the beginning to end is beyond their ability. They get bored and they abandon it. When you, have, uh, when you are trained by the TV screen, which has 200 or 300 channels, and you are zapping from one to another, never see the uh, performance till the end, you just, you are frightened that on another channel at the same time something more interesting may happen, then uh, the ability to concentrate, to focus on one task, on one, on one problem, and be determined to follow it uh, over time. Now this skill, it's a very difficult skill, mind you, it has to be trained, you are, Children don't get it uh, from birth. They have to be learning from This skill is disappearing. We are the one of the collateral aid victims of uh, electronics is precisely the patience and, and attention. Yes. Uh, some time ago, uh, uh, we, we, we were afraid of, of censorship, the police state, but now, Uh, we, we live more or less in a free society, let's yeah. say it so, uh, and uh, 
there are other ways of, you know, of subtract. Uh -huh. if, if you read a, new, a good newspaper, you are not well informed. What, for instance, in Europe. I don't know what the uh, Portuguese equivalent to the English expression DIY, do it yourself, is. <laughs> is there such an expression? Yes. But we are moving in general terms, not only in this case, um, to the DIY society, like IKEA, this uh, furniture firm. Is there only yes, here? Yes, yes, yes. Well, they give you the kit and you assemble it yourself. Do it yourself. So that's, uh, this is a problem. Um, the officers of censorship became redundant once we have internalized censorship. We are doing it ourselves. With the help, of course, of the so-called public opinion, pressure of commercials, pressure Lobbies. of media, pressure of newspapers, and so on. We are guided by the first page of o Globo, for example. O Globo is very re reputable, very wise, uh, very positive uh, newspaper, but nevertheless, it makes opinion for us. Oh, yes. We, are, we, we embrace that. In, in this case, we are quiet. <laughs> and then we apply it, do it yourself. Uh, uh, censorship either could be bureaucratized, institutionalized, as it was in solid modernity, or it can be do it yourself, censorship, as it is in liquid modernity. That's my answer. Yes, but uh, if you have if you have at this society many uh, pluralistic options, it, mm. uh, it could be, be better. Brazil, for instance, has the media very concentrated. Yes, that, that's a, there's a possibility, a very attractive possibility, pluralism on information, multi-centered information coming from different resources. That's it. But I want to disappoint you, terribly sorry, <laughs> because all sociological research shows that this opportunity lies unused, abandoned. Um, uh, most people who are using computer try to uh, create for themselves what I call comfort zone, like echo chamber. The only sounds which, uh, you hear are echoes of your Yourself. own voice, or a hall of mirrors. The only sights you see are reflections of your own face. Comfort zone. Comfort zone you can't create on the street. You can't create it offline. You can create it only online. Because it's so simple. You just stop answering to certain, stop looking at the websites which you find uh, resentful. You just switch them off. You can't switch them off on the street when you find passerby which are not to your liking. What can you do? You have to live with them. You can't escape it. That's why I'm speaking about uh, tranquilizers coming <laughs> uh, from Facebook and, and other internet gadgets. O Observatório da Imprensa faz outro rápido intervalo na entrevista com pensador humanista polonês Zygmunt Bauman. Voltamos já. O Observatório da Imprensa está de volta com a entrevista especial do filósofo e pensador humanista polonês Zygmunt Bauman. Do you think that we need uh, new ideological options, for instance? Thinking in, because of what is happening in, in Europe, uh, our, our political dictionary could, be, could, could not be enlarged, mo modernized, uh, updated. For instance, liberalism yeah. means in economy one thing, in politics <laughs> the yeah. other way. Yeah. Couldn't be a liberal in both, in both. No, I agree with you. I, I am aware of, of, of that problem. It is a problem, revising the vocabulary which we use to describe and comprehend the world. Yes, that's very true, but uh, uh, words and things uh, walk different ways. You know, they, 
one of them, one of my personal tragedies that I produce a lot of words and I achieved uh, very little deeds, if any, you know, the world uh, is not stripped of its uh, evils. Uh, so uh, I think that what is needed, you say, new ideology, it is wider than new words, new terms, but I think that it should be, we should step even one uh, step further and say, go beyond ideology. Yeah. One thing is the conception of um, the effective collective action, and the other thing uh, is uh, conception of good life, which are both wrong in our, in our society. The first one, conception of effective action, of resolution of troubles which you confront. It is a common belief, very seldom questioning, that the means, the cure to all kinds of social problems is increase in GNP, in the gross national product. Whatever is the problem, the reaction, we must produce further. Well, I just uh, mentioned only on the margin that it is unsustainable because you cannot, on our planet, increase production permanently. There are limits. And the other thing is the, is the, at our conception of good life. Uh, our generation, well, oh. our power. <laughs> participation, not to which we belong, but in which we participate. Now, uh, this generation has been brought up to believe that all the road to happiness leads through shops. <laughs> And that's also a catastrophic idea because it spells Consuming. a lot of trouble for our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. We are just living, living at their expense. We are depriving them of their living. So here, I think, uh, lies the crux. We have to promote as strongly as we are able that uh, the idea that these two assumptions are unsustainable. That here must be, we have to learn different ways of reacting to problems and different ways of pursuing happiness. Next year, we'll, we'll celebrate 500 years of utopia. Uh, Next year, Thomas More wrote uh, 500, yes. Yes, 500. So, uh, and uh, we are seeing that, uh, for instance, one of the good utopias of, of this moment is the European Union. Never we could imagine or dream that a voluntary integration in Europe for so many countries and, and, and no wars, no borders, and suddenly, we see Hungary closing the borders because they don't want yeah. the strangers to come. Yeah. The, Kur the Kurds. Building not. walls instead of bridges. Yeah. So we are seeing that utopia leads to dystopia. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and next year we, we, we have to face the, oh. the concept of utopia. An instant made so good my society. dear Senor Dinesh, don't you think that it is fate of all utopias? Oh, yes. Utopia is creative, is a blessing as long as it remains utopia because it guides human dreams, human actions, uh, gives you courage to act and things like that. But when it is proclaimed fulfilled, then the trouble begins. Then it transforms into dystopia. In dystopia. That's true. That's true. And, uh, but, uh, do you think that the utopia of United U Europe can be go, go on? Well, I, I, I published a little book called yes, uh, I know. Europe Un Unfinished Adventure. I still consider it a valid ex expression. It is still unfinished and still adventure. We are still walking into the darkness because uh, there is no precedent to European Union. That's the first thing touched in history. 
that after hundreds of years of mutual enmity, bloody wars, uh, devastation, suddenly the, all is forgotten, apparently. The Frenchman kissed the, the Dutch, uh, sorry, the, the, the German. German. Germans kiss the Frenchmen, you know, they go to visit each other, they appreciate each other's culture and so on. And the things unthinkable in 1930s when I was a child, that was beyond comprehension, impossible, impossible to happen. It did happen. And also, uh, 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 but uh, it's, it's the experiment in, in, in implementing alternative way of togetherness, this experiment is still continuing. And continuation means that there are all, uh, all sorts of uh, 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 throwbacks, throwbacks. You encounter, for example, this uh, influx of, uh, of uh, refugees, uh, migrants, and previously we encountered the collapse of the credit economy, of spending money which people did not earn, and that, and that caused, shattered the, 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 the euro system and made it dubitable. But you see, one considers another. The history of the European Union is a long string of antagonism, of conflict, of troubles, of problems. But this can be... But somehow it survives so far. It can be managed? Yeah. Well, you see, I, I, I constantly repeat that I'm pessimist in the short run and <laughs> optimist in the long run. Good. I, I, I want to believe, and if people really believe that the European Union is workable, in itself it is already one of very important conditions to make it workable. And the more we are doubting that it is workable, the more doubtful its future is. So let's be careful. <laughs> Let me ask a very short question, but very important. The future of Poland. Poland? Poland, mm. the yeah. country where, yes. where you was born, and uh, my father yeah. served in the army. So uh, uh, what is the future of because Poland suffered so many invasions and dilapidations, and now it's lost. It belongs to, the, to a new combination of, with Hungary, the Czechoslovakia, yeah. and it's, what is the future? No, it's not time or place to summarize your Polish history. It's a very long history, oh, yes. very dramatic. <laughs> I don't even attempt it to do. But uh, I would like to uh, uh, bring to your attention, to you know about it, but let's recall it, um, the uh, uh, geopolitical, so to speak, factors in the history of Poland. Do you know that from between Berlin and Moscow, there's not a single mountain. It's completely flat. So all armies in the history of the conflict between East and West went through Poland. It is a very, very severely tested uh, nation. And no wonder that uh, Poles are inclined to have this uh, uh, tendency to think about their history as martyrology, martyrology, history of suffering. Uh, history of suffering, and they have very good reason to do so. Yes. And, uh, but if you have such a version of history, then obviously you tend to be suspicious to all the foreigners, bloody foreigners, you know, that... Uh, no, they... Uh, it, it is... The, uh, Poland is in much safer, stabler, uh, uh, acceptable, likable condition than it was 25 years ago. I would go further, that it was ever in its history. It's much safer. I remember when I was a child, Poland was surrounded by enemies. Now there are no enemies around. And we have to think about distant uh, Putin in order to be afraid. Or <laughs> Viktor Orban in yes, Hungary. Right. <laughs> Another question about Brazil. What do you think of the Brazilian miracle? A miracle? Yes. You think it's a miracle? No, already? no, no. People use it to say that yes. there is a... Well, 
I would say it is an unfinished miracle. You are on the way. I wish you with all my heart to arrive there, you know. Uh, the, uh, I would only say 66 representatives of 66 governments of the world came to Rio de Janeiro to consult, to learn from the experience of drawing 22 million people from their poverty. No one repeated that miracle. It's only Brazil so far. I wish you to continue, but it is also now the shortcomings are coming to the fore. And because, uh, and the, the next day, next year, uh, Olympics, I think, are close to rethink the situation. It may happen because it is unfinished miracle. And uh, you can't uh, make an, in such condition any prediction. What it inspires only is the effort to avert the premature end of the miracle. The temptations to... Right. Thank you. Thank you. Quando o Observatório da Imprensa terminou a entrevista com o pensador e humanista polonês Zygmunt Bauman, a sua mulher, que o acompanhou na fulminante visita ao Rio de Janeiro, me disse, já ouvi Zygmunt milhares de vezes, e ele tem cada vez a capacidade de dizer uma coisa nova. Espero que vocês achem isso também. E lembre-se, acompanhando o Observatório da Imprensa, pela TV, pela internet, você nunca mais vai ler jornal do mesmo jeito. Uma boa noite.